Parenting does not end when our kids become adults, but lots of things have to change. Join me for this special conversation with my guest today on Family Vision. Rob Reno here with Visionary Family Ministries. As you know, God has blessed Amy and me with seven children. We have two kids married, off the payroll, two in college, one high school, one junior high, and one third grader. So the area of parenting where we are growing the most, stretching the most, experiencing for the first time, is this whole realm of parenting adult kids. Uh, Right, we've had a lot of third graders over the years, but we now just have these two new marrieds and then our college son and our college daughter on the brink of full adulthood. And we are learning a lot about this new stage of parenting. So I came up with an idea because I need a lot of help and a lot of guidance in this area. I reached out to Jim Burns who has decades of experience in family ministry. And I asked him if he would be willing to help us here at Family Vision. I asked him if he would be willing to come on and uh, do a couple episodes of interview where we could talk about his new book, Doing Life with Your Adult Children. And secretly, I wanted to have him on so basically I could get a couple counseling sessions. So the approach is, is that we'll let you in to my counseling sessions with Jim as we talk about doing life with our adult children. Now, I also want to encourage you, maybe you're here, you've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and here you are uh, thinking that the episode is just going to be about parenting adult kids. It is. We're going to talk about that, uh, but don't tune out. Listen to this. It is going to help prepare you to get some foundational things in the relationship with your child that are going to help carry you forward when you enter this new phase of parenting adult kids. So here we go. Doing life with your adult children with my special guest, Jim Burns. Jim, you probably don't know it, but you've had an impact on my life for a long time, all the way back when uh, I was a youth pastor and you were training youth leaders, especially helping youth leaders understand this whole partnering with parents thing. Uh, But you've been faithfully serving families in the church for decades. Uh, And I'm grateful for that. I want to follow in in your footsteps with your example of faithfulness. So thanks for the big impact you've made in my life. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about parenting adult children. But before we do that, can you just introduce yourself, share a little bit about your story with uh, the Family Vision community? Well, well, thanks for those kind words. And also, Rob, thanks for what you're doing. It really is making a difference. And I appreciate that you stay solid in your faith. And uh, as we talk about the issues, even like what we're going to talk about today, it's it's so key and important. And it's great that you have this platform and are building this platform too. Um, well, I'm the president of Homeward. Homeward uh, has four principles uh, that we live by. Uh, uh, competent parents, strong marriages, empowered kids and healthy leaders. And so all of our content, all of our um, writing, our our courses, our teaching, our trainers where we train others, uh, it's all about those four issues and it's under those things. And it's um, it's it's been a great run with Homeward. I love the fact that we get a chance to uh, speak to parents and uh, help them and also speak to leaders who are also working on the whole aspect of family ministry. So I love my job. And uh, plan on doing it, and you know, till I, uh, you know, lose all of my teeth or something. <laughs> anyway, awesome. I'm married to Kathy. We've been married 48 years. Um, we always say that it's a high maintenance marriage. So when we got married, both of us were not raised in the church. So when we became Christian, and I was a youth pastor, we thought, well, this is going to be easy. Well, it wasn't easy, and um, and we, you know, we figured it out. We we have written together. We speak together, um, and then I have three adult children. Three. Um, sons-in-laws, because I have all girls, and um, and then three grandkids, who I'm going to see this afternoon. So I'm excited about seeing at least two of the grandkids this afternoon. So that's me. That's fantastic. Thanks. So our time together is going to be 50% personal counseling for me and 50% talking about uh, right. more broadly this issue of parenting adult children. As you probably know, I've got two children married and off the payroll. I've got two in college and then a high schooler, junior higher, and a third grader. And announcement, announcement, announcement. Uh, We were blessed with our first grandchild. Lissy and Bond had baby A.V. about uh, six, seven months ago. So we have started our grandparenting, uh, our grandparenting journey. 
Um, something that uh, you'll get a kick out of uh, as we began to teach visionary parenting over the years, and especially when our kids were little, I, um, I used to say that I really thought that the infant years, right, when you had babies and diapers, that those were the years uh, that were the most difficult, that were the most challenging when it came to parenting, right? The time and the sleepless nights and all the laundry and all that. And obviously, uh, in your parenting journey, as your kids get older, it's going to take less time and it's going to get easier. Now, I didn't actually say that from the platform. A couple times that I did, I noticed uh, the, the gray-haired folks out there either just smiled politely or right. sometimes laughed out loud. Right. Uh, because they were very aware of what I'm aware of now, which is that babies are a piece of cake, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, yes, the, the sleepless nights and the diapers right. and all that. Yeah. So I wanted to talk with you about this subject because I loved your book, Doing Life with Your Adult Children. And my first question for you is the subtitle, which I think was fantastic. Subtitle of the book is Keep Your Mouth Shut and the Welcome Mat Out. So let's just start there. Right. What does that mean? And why did you put it on the cover of the book? Well, I put it on the book partly because um, that book was part research and part life, my own life. You know, it's much more personal than some of the parenting books that I've written, because I feel like you that, you know, not that it was easy in those early stages. I was speaking to some people last night who had younger kids. And I, I would kind of said the same thing as you. I, I just said, look, at each stage has its challenges and it has it has its beauty. Embrace it. But I was saying, never thought that by the time my kids got to be adults, that it would be the, the harder thing. And it took me by surprise. In fact, I remember my wife, Kathy, saying, wow, didn't see it coming like that, you know, because our kids sort of bumped. They, they were raised in the church, first generation. We were first generation Christians. So they were, you know, the next generation. And we liked church a lot better than they did. And, and you know, my gosh, we were more passionate and our kids, you know, would go oh, you know, this is boring today. And I'm like, wait, boring, you know, where, where can this be? And when they got to be adults, they they bumped a little bit. They weren't horrible, but, you know, they were questioning their faith more. Christy, our oldest said, I had to disown my parents' faith to own my own faith. Mm -hmm. And today she goes to the same church we go to. We live near each other. She's more involved in church than we are in many ways, but that was not the case during those early adult years. And, uh, you know, she went to a Christian school. So she said, that's my church. I don't need to go to church. I don't have, you know, she didn't have much fellowship, et cetera. But the point being that for us, it took us by surprise. But what really took us by surprise, and you can see, you can't see it maybe on this Zoom, but I have scars on my tongue because I would say something to my kids as I had done for two decades. And they would take that as criticism mm -hmm. because the criticism was that they would say, well, you don't trust me to be an adult. And I go, no, 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 I'm just trying to help out. I've been dad. That's what we do. We give, we give advice. We, we try to fix things. And so the uh, keep your mouth shut and the welcome that out means that sometimes you just have to literally keep their mouth shut because here's the deal. It's a great principle that you and I teach with youngers too, but experience is a better teacher than advice. And sometimes they have to experience it themselves. And what I learned with my uh, adult kids and actually even older teens, because that's another stage, big time, getting them prepared, was there were just times when I needed to kind of go, wouldn't be doing it that way. I do that at my office here with, with staff, but I wasn't doing it with my kids. And so I had to learn to keep my mouth shut. But at the same time, keep my milk, welcome that out, because what I was seeing in the adult children world was that parents were shunning their kids because their kids were violating values, because their kids were had a different political belief than them, because their kids, you know, had such, uh, you know, just all kinds of different things. They were maybe were smoking pot. They were moved in with a girlfriend. They had gender issues that were different. All of the things. I'm not saying that you change your values, but what I am saying is that you still got to keep your welcome mat up because a lot of times the decisions that your adult kids are making, they're they're going to crash. And if they crash or when they crash, if you don't have the welcome mat out, they're not coming back because you're not safe. So interesting enough, it's a very, I thought about word for word by, for that subtitle. Cause, and it is funny. I tell people, I said it last night, I was talking about the book, doing life with your adult children. Uh, and I said, keep your you know, mouth shut and the welcome mat out. And I go, pretty much you don't need the book now. Cause that just summarizes everything. If you could just keep your mouth shut and the welcome mat out, there's more to it, of course. But, but you see, to me, it's very important that we learn to um, change to become 
more almost more adult to adult relationships. So that means we've got to keep our mouth shut sometimes. I don't I don't tell everybody in my office here. I'm pointing around my office. I don't point it to everybody in my office and tell them what to do. And then also still keep that welcome mat out so that when my kids would crash or do something silly, they would we would be the people they would come to. So I want to pick up. Yeah, thank you. I want to pick up on something you said. You just talked about like the changing relationship. I think you use this phrase adult to adult. I remember when my, <clears throat> I have a, a 20 year old son, JD, he was 13, 14 years old. And he was, he was really annoyed kind of whenever I was around basically. And I could sense he was sort of bristling when I tried to talk to him. And right. finally, after unpacking this, what he ended up telling me was that he was uh, feeling hurt and angry because I was talking to him constantly like a little kid. He used this phrase. He said, I want you to talk to me like my older brother, RW, who was 17. Yeah. And you talk to me like my little brother, Ray, who was seven. Right. And as I asked him to explain that to me, because I had no clue that I was doing this. Sure. He was absolutely right. Yeah. And yeah. I had failed to move from parent to elementary schooler, right? Yes. Yeah. To parent to early high schooler. Right, right. Now, so what you're saying is we've got all the more changes to come that, that we've got this late teenager, we've got this college student, now we've got this independent yeah. adult. Talk yeah. to me about okay. what we have to lock in on as parents. What are the key ingredients to okay. this next change? Okay, well, let's start, let's start with, with his story because at 13, I would, I, I, yesterday, I would, last night I was speaking to a group and I, I went through five stages of parenting, but we'll start at the stage right before him two to 10. That's controlling. You're in control. I mean, you're micromanaging in its best ways. You're trying to protect your children. You're not going to let them go play at the mall or by us, we live by the beach. You're not going to let them go. Oh yeah, just go ahead and go to the beach. You're in control. But at 13, you have to move to coaching and uh, coaches are still in control. Coaches give timeouts, coaches, you know, give input. So it's not like you're not parenting, but you're beginning to allow them just beginning to allow them to make their own decisions because what's the bottom line if a kid is two years old, five years old, 13 years old, or 17 years old, or adult, to become a responsible adult. That's what we do for parenting. They move from dependence on us to independence. So the move at 13 is to begin to coach them. And then by the time they're like 15, which was um, RWs, it's it's really consulting. Most of their day-to-day decisions are going to have to be done by them, whether we like it or not, Mm -hmm. right? Because some of us are still in the control mode. But once they become young adults, it's not coaching, it's not consulting. There's a little bit of that, but it's, it's caring. And so you move to mentor role. And so the role that you take with your adult kids is, I think, the pause, the healthy way is much more a new job description. You're not parenting day to day any longer, but actually what you want to get to is to mentor. Mentor, I have a mentor that I just was with. I, I'm in a small group. I've been in it for 21 years and I was just with one of the guys in that group. He's about 10 years older than me. And the interesting side to to that is he doesn't press me. He waits for me. Um, So I I had five questions to ask him the other day and I had, I was all prepped and I said, Hey, I want to ask you this and this. And it's mainly about, um, you know, life and marriage and parenting. He's farther along grandkids. He's, I mean, again, like I said, he's older and but but he's not he's not taking the the active role. He's waiting for me. And I think with with adult kids, it's that caring enough to keep our mouth shut and allow them to kind of move the 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 needle. Uh, Kathy and I were talking about this just the other day. We had Sunday, uh, which was just a few days ago for us in terms of this recording. Um, we had a birthday, and so the whole all eleven of us were together for a birthday party. And when we were done. And I said, well, it was a little crazy because you got three grandkids running around like crazy. And she goes, yeah, but you know, it was really neat because I had the best conversation with two of, two of the daughters and it was more of a mentoring type conversation. And so finally, we've learned that if we wait, they will come. If you build it, remember the movie, Filled with Dreams, if you build it, they'll come. And I think that really is the case of, of making that happen. Now, remember, it doesn't just happen as a, you know, you graduate from high school and now we're changing everything. I think it's a process. And the reason I think it's a process, Rob, is because our kids have never been adults before, so they don't have any clue how to be an adult, right? I mean, they just don't. 
I mean, they, they say at 18, I'm an adult, treat me like an adult. And you're going, yeah, but I'm still paying for your cell phone. I'm helping you with college. I've got insurance. Uh, plus you're acting like a, a ding dong right now. So I'm going to have to, you're living in my house. So I'm going to have to deal with that. Right. But it's a process of moving as quick as you can really to that mentoring type role, which is, you know, I feel for you. I'm sorry. You don't have the money to, you know, pay for your car insurance. Um, but you, you, you can't just bail them out every time. So mm -hmm. you begin to, you know, what could you do differently? Or, you know, what's the exit strategy for leaving the house? Because you really do want to leave the house eventually. What's that exit strategy? Let's get a plan together and, and put it in. That's mentoring more than telling them what to do. And for us telling them what to do, people, it's hard. Yeah. All right. Well, help me with that. So again, I've got two married out of the house, off the payroll, I find myself wanting to give advice. And of course, it all comes from a wonderful heart, right? Now, they haven't asked for advice, but I would like to offer it. Exactly. Um, how would you, you how, how might they receive that yeah. if I just go ahead yeah. and well, say it? Well, a lot of times, you know, one of the principles in the book is, you know, that unsolicited advice is taken as criticism. We, we're not, that's, our motives are good. But what they hear is, you don't trust me to be an adult, okay? So I think what we do is we have to, we have to back it up. Um, what I do, and I still give advice to them, but what I'll do is I'll say, hey, can I have some permission to, to, to bring something up that I've noticed? And in that, like, for example, we had a, a big one like two weeks ago, our two grandkids, and, and we watched the grandkids uh, a couple of days a week because both parents are working and our daughter is a teacher and it's a joy to do this. And Kathy takes the heavy lifting, but they were out of control and it was kind of a mess. And so I said to Christy, when she got there, I said, hey, I want to have a meeting. They're both on timeout right now. <laughs> <laughs> I had one in one room and one in the other. And and I said, and I'm laughing at this because I'm the grandparent. I'm having a blast with these kids. I'm it's not the end of the world. I'm going, I'm going to hand them back to Christy. But I said, Christy, I'd like, I got an idea. I'd like to bring them together and I'd like to just say a couple of things to them about respect, but I'd like you here, but I don't want to, I don't want to take over your deal. So I why I think it's I have a special relationship with these kids. So Christy goes, that's a great idea, Dad. Now, she's not always said that's a great idea, Dad. But so Christy sat there, I sat there, I said my little thing, and I gave them hugs and told them how much I loved them. And then Christy said, now, here's some consequences. So I didn't give them consequences. But Christy said, James, you're, mm -hmm. he's seven. You're off a of screen time for this long, and, and you know why, and you know whatever. And Charlotte, here's what your deal is. And Charlotte goes, you're the meanest mom. And I kind of laughed because it transferred. It wasn't me. you know. So I, I started the process, but then I, I gave it over to Christy. And then... Christy handled it, I thought, so well before the kids were put in the car and seat belted in, you know, car seats and all that. I just gave her a big hug and I said, Christy, you're an amazing mom. Hmm. Tears welled up in her eyes. This is just last week. Tears welled up in her eyes and she goes, Dad, thank you so much for saying that. Hmm. So the point was, I'm not always, I mean, that sounds like a good gym one and it was, but it was me saying, I've got something I want to say, but I want your permission. You know, and that was about grandkids. But I think we do it about most anything, Rob. I think it's better to say, you know, uh, can I can I ask you? I mean, I have I tell a story in the book early. This has to do with Christy too. But I, she's our our kid who is like, you know, wow, she's wild. She was strong willed and whatever. But um, I they were trying to move to Texas, and they were both they were living at our house for two two months, which is always interesting. And they were having a discussion about the move. And uh, um, I thought both of them were wrong on how to move. I mean, I thought there was an easier way that was the same economics. I was in the kitchen and I said, hey, can I have permission to kind of break in here? They were mad at each other. So it's weird to see your children when they're living with you, you see them fighting or you see them doing stuff. You're like, oh, wait, I want to break this up. But so I said, hey, do I have permission? And Christy, not looking at me, said, not now, dad, not now. Right. I went, Okay. So they moved and they did Steve's way, which I thought was worse than Christie's way. Usually Steve, I take Steve's side on some of these things. That's my, <laughs> my son-in-law. And uh, it was a disaster. We get there to Dallas about a week later and uh, the, the crib fell out. So they lost their crib. And Kathy, I ended up going to Target and buying a new crib for them. Um, they lost bolts for certain things and one dresser was gone. And Christy says to me, uh, hey, we were talking about all the disaster. And, and she goes, Dad, you had an idea. And I, go, oh, it was. and I told her, she goes, Dad, why didn't you tell me? And I'm like, well, you told me not to. You know what? Guess what? When they moved back, which they were only there for a year, when they moved back, 
they did my way. <laughs> wow. Experience is a better teacher than advice. Do you know how, Rob, it was so hard for me not to say, you guys are both wrong. Let me just tell you and butt, and butt in. But that's not the job that we do with our adult kids. Yeah. And it's hard. And I think it, it's hard because we now you have a grandchild. So you begin to see them do something with a grandchild and you go, Wait, don't do it that way. Do it this way. I'm visionary family. I got, I got the <laughs> answers for you guys, right? Um, so I do that. I want to say that. And I, I just know I have to you know, keep my mouth shut. We have several things in our life right now with our, with our adult children that we'd really like to tell them what to do. And they had to learn it their, their own way. It's sometimes really hard, by a hard way. Our daughter, Heidi, who's our youngest, she and her husband, they live in Los Angeles and they bought an incredible house, three stories, uh, sounds fancier than it is, on a hill, but they didn't have a child. Now they have a two-year-old and this is like disaster waiting to happen. This kid could fall, right? We told them that, but they kind of went, uh, uh, so then I said to Kathy, we have to to back off of this. And she goes, this is the health of a child one day. Well, now they're panicked because they want to move from this place because um, it's not good for the, you know, having a two-year-old, uh, you know, by any means. We just had, it's so hard because we went, this is, this could be, you know, death or dying type of a thing, or, you know, at least some scrapes. Right. Right. Here's a question or a challenge that we hear a lot in the counseling ministry uh, parent of an adult child who just says the world is so different. The yeah. culture that my children have grown up in or are in now is so different. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up when there were boys and girls. Uh, yes. I grew up when there was a, a consensus about basic morality, whether you were a Christian or not. I grew yeah. up when truth existed, that yeah. if you had a conversation, a person could actually be right or wrong. And like, that was something we could talk about. Um, how do we help parents who are trying to build this relationship, this mentor relationship with these adult kids who really are soaking in quite a different culture. Oh, exactly. Well, first of all, our, as parents, I think one of our job descriptions is to become a student of their culture. We don't have to agree with it, by the way. Please don't hear me say, oh, no, we just give in to all of this stuff. What I'm saying is we have to be a student of their culture because, you know, there are certain distinctives with millennials and now Gen Zs that really are different than in the world that we lived in. And so my daughter, Chrissy, is at the height of, she's a millennial and at the height of the millennials, but my kids are more millennials. And Gen Z is another study that's coming along. These would be the younger adults, um, your kids, you know, who are the, you know, your 20 year old, definitely, you know, who's, who's a Gen Z. And there are these distinctives and we have to learn the distinctives to understand why on, the, why on earth are they acting the way they are and why does it take them so long to grow up? Uh, so I have a prayer. <laughs> My prayer is, Lord, teach me to parent the children I have, not the child I was or the kid I um, thought my kids would be, you know. Um, and, you know, it's a simple prayer, but it means I've got to learn what is what is driving this. And uh, so I have to understand that the distinctive is they're, you know, they're definitely shaped by technology. Technology today, you and I are using technology. It's our friend, but technology isn't necessarily our moral friend on a lot of things, right? What the, where they're getting input. There is good news that when, especially the millennials, we don't know enough about Gen Z yet, but with millennials, the number one thing they want, they've meandered toward marriage. They've meandered toward maybe coming back to faith. They've meandered like crazy. It's driving us nuts, responsibility even. But once they get married and they have babies, they have marriage is their number one thing. And baby and, and parenting is their number one thing. That's what they say. That's it. That's incredible. So as a parent, you're looking at all this lousy stuff, but you also have to look at the fact that, you know, just to summarize some of it, they view tolerance as a form of, of loving. And so they can't understand that um, we're not tolerant towards some of the things you mentioned, politics, gender, um, even pornography, living together, you know, you mentioned that in a previous, my parents weren't Christian, but they didn't believe in cohabitation. Today, you know, 75% of people do cohabitate and even Christian parents are sometimes going, well, you know, that's how it is. I get that. But we have to understand going back to the idea of, uh, of um, just, you know, studying the culture is that that's there. This is what they believe makes for interesting conversations around the dinner table at Thanksgiving, I'm sure. But the point being is, is it possible for us to embrace them and actually agree not to disagree, but not do it with trying to go tit for tat and back and forth? I don't find that as, as helpful. 
So I have a daughter who's political. We're not, we don't, at home, we don't talk about politics. So I figure there's Democrats who need help with their kids. There's Republicans. So you just don't hear me ever talk about politics, although I have some strong feelings about, you know, the polit- politics. Okay. But it, you know, my wife and my dog know how I vote. Okay. But point go, and my kids sort of do. So we have one daughter who's very different on a different scale. She went to a, to a secular school that just totally, yeah, man, she's looking at it from a different angle, politics. Um, we have learned to agree to disagree, but I don't try to convert her. And funny enough, because I'm not trying to convert her, she's not trying to convert me. At first, she was trying to convert me. Um, but what I have found is we can kind of come together. And now, like she just sent me a, a, a DM on some kind of a political thing that sounds much more like me than it does her. <laughs> so she, because I'm safe, She's allowing me in. So these parents, going back to the fact, we said this at the beginning of the podcast, but the parents who are shunning their kids because they are living with someone else. I mean, I'm not for that. I don't think you agree. And I think that you say, look, you're making some adult decisions. So obviously we're now not paying for this, you know, whatever. But that's that's going to, they're going to crash. I mean, if the divorce rate is still 35 to 50% of a divorce rate, there's a pretty good chance that cohabitation, which doesn't work, is going to um, help. I mean, eventually they're going to crash. Well, if we're not safe, we can be safe by still saying, hey, we we agree to disagree. So I'm saying to people, don't be a one-topic parent, broaden it out. Um, Because almost every parent who's listening or watching this, they have struggled with something that their adult kids are doing. And if they turn it into a, because their heart is breaking, if they turn it into a a one-topic situation, they could lose their kid. Don't do that over a top. No topic is that important. Amen. You know, Jesus, very interestingly enough, Jesus wasn't tolerant to a lot of things, but a lot of things he wasn't tolerant to was the hypocrisy of, of you know, religious people. So Jesus had the ability to make it not just one topic. You think, you know, he's talking to a prostitute. He's, he's not only talking to the prostitute about one issue. He's talking to a tax collector who would have been a bad guy in that day. You know, you start looking at what Jesus did. Well, he he had strong principles, obviously, but he also broadened the relationship. So he was he was in trouble sometimes because he invited the tax he went to the tax collector's house or he invited a prostitute into his home. I mean, the religious people didn't think that was a good idea, but Jesus was able to do that. Well, aren't we able then to do that with our own kids, realizing that this is a marathon, it's not a sprint? So yeah, we don't love what you did. Boy, amen to that, Jim. I mean, if our kids are hurting, struggling, far from us, far from God, I mean, they need us to be praying for and pursuing them more than more than ever. I appreciate that uh, so much. And what I'd like to do is to continue our conversation. We're going to have you back for next week's episode on uh, on Family Vision, and we're going to pick up our conversation right here. You are not going to want to miss next week's conversation with Jim Burns as we continue to talk about what it takes to build great relationships with our adult kids. Connect with Jim at his website at homeword.com. Pick up a copy of this great book, Doing Life with Your Adult Children. Find it wherever you buy your books or at Jim's website. And we have another resource that I'd like to commend to you, and this is specifically For any parent or grandparent who has an older teenager or an adult child who is far from God, this older child is struggling in their faith. Maybe they were raised in a Christian environment, but regardless of what's happened right now, they are far from the Lord. We have a resource. It's both a book and a video Bible study called Never Too Late, Encouraging Faith in Your Adult Child. And hopefully the title is self-explanatory. The message is that it's never too late. It's never too late for God to use you as mom or dad, grandma, grandpa, no matter how old you are, how old they are, how many miles separate you, God still has a plan to use you to be a spiritual blessing and encouragement in the life of your adult son or your adult daughter. You can get the Never Too Late book and the video series at our website, visionaryfam.com. And you can get the book, of course, wherever you buy your books. 
I also want to invite you to join me, join us for some upcoming live Visionary Family events. March 18th, we have two events. Amy and I are dividing and conquering. I will be out in Seattle speaking at the Northwest Ministry Conference. I'll be talking to church leaders about uniting church and family in the Great Commission. Amy and Lissy will be back here in the Chicago area. They are doing a special event Saturday morning, March 18th, for moms and daughters together. It's going to be at Wheaton Academy, Saturday morning, 9 to 10.30 a.m. Special event. How can you grow a stronger relationship as mother and daughter and a stronger faith together? Then, April 10 to 12... Amy and I will be speaking at the D6 conference in Orlando. This is the premier family ministry training event in our country. And then April 28th and 29th, I'll be back again in Seattle speaking at the Christian Heritage Home Discipleship Conference, April 28th and 29th. So all the information for those events, how you can be a part of it, send those to friends and family who may live in those parts of the country and find out when we have some events uh, coming your way in 2023. So thanks again to Jim Burns for joining us today. He'll be back with us next week for part two. I'd love your thoughts and questions about our conversation. Email me, podcast at visionaryfam.com. And I'm looking forward to our next time with you on Family Vision. It means so much to us to have you be a part of the Family Vision community. If this episode was meaningful for you, would you share it with a friend, with a family member? You can actually partner with us to bring hope and help to families around the world. We are praying that Family Vision is a blessing to you and your family. So thank you for joining us here. We look forward to our next time together.